All right, we are live and we should be on Twitch, YouTube, and Periscope. So hello everyone. And you know, we're gonna start seeing some people showing up and uh, and then we'll really kick it off. But until then, I guess I just want to kind of give an overview of what we're gonna be talking about uh, today. Um, we're joined by Pranav from the Graph Protocol, who uh, I work with at Edge and Node, and uh, Patrick Collins from uh, Chainlink. And, um, you know, I, I can't really explain what Chainlink is as good as Patrick can, so I'll probably let him do that. But we're going to be basically doing our demo, or Patrick is going to be doing a demo of how you can uh, generate dynamic NFTs um, in a Solidity smart contract using you know, um, chain link and SVG. So it's a really cool idea and um, a really cool thing to, to see and understand how you might be able to kind of like apply some of these ideas and in different ways and stuff like that. So I'm pretty excited to see how this, uh, how this turns out. So um, we have, we have a bunch of people here now, so let's go ahead and I guess get started. Um, do you want to give an intro Patrick and then I'll ask Pranav to also do the same? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I was just uh, retweeting your, your Periscope here. Um, saying, yeah, we're, we're going to do some really cool stuff. We're going to, we have a really cool tutorial for everybody here um, doing some really advanced NFT pieces. But uh, yeah, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a developer advocate uh, on, on the Chainlink protocol. So I, I love working with Chainlink. I love working with smart contracts, Solidity. Uh, this is what I do day in, day out. Um, I absolutely love this space uh, and really excited to be here with uh, with Natter and, and Pranav. Um, who who uh, I've I've known Pranav for a while now. Uh, we've we've uh, synced for quite some time, and, and really excited to to sync with Natter more because his uh, his videos are phenomenal. If you haven't seen his full stack uh, Ethereum uh, YouTube video, it's it's great. Definitely go check it out. Um, but yeah, so I, I I I love smart contracts, but in particular, definitely an Oracle expert. Anything um, that is off data, any type of data you want to work with that's off chain, or any type of external computation, really anything. Outside this this um, this uh, deterministic blockchain that we work with, that's where oracles uh, oracles come in, and that's where their power really shines. So, uh, in the demo, we're going to show you uh, everybody here today. We're actually going to be pulling in pricing data from the real world to influence what our NFT actually looks like, which is going to be uh, really exciting. So, sorry, I droned on. Uh, Pranav, all you man. Hey, uh, so nice to be here <laughs> with, with 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 the two two legends of you know the influencer development web three ecosystem. So, anyways, I'm Pranav uh, Maheshwari. I'm a solutions engineer at Edge and Node, which is the initial team behind the Graph, and now one of the three core devs working on the Graph protocol, indexing smart, uh, you know everything that's blockchain. Possibly when you know when when everything goes west, everything is like on blockchain, and we have decentralized future. It is possibly the, the 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 Google of the future because it indexes in every sense, uh, right? That uh, I've been uh, in, uh, working very closely with Nether because we are in the same organization, you know, sharing same values of decentralization and Web three, and believe in the Web three stack very very strongly. And uh, also, I've been in touch with uh, Patrick for a very long time, talking about Chainlink and its role in making Web3 stack and decentralized infrastructure and you know applications a reality. Awesome. Yeah. And um, Pranav, you also worked with Polygon before the graph, right? And Polygon yeah. is one of the pro projects that I've been pretty interested in. So I thought that was Got pretty it. cool. Yeah, that's that's also something that we should work, work with. And they are also like, you know, uh, building something for Ethereum and Web3 stack in general. So always been a fan of Web3 stack and, you know, different, different infrastructures that power people to use and build decentralized application and making decentralization a reality. Yeah, and Patrick, I actually learned um, some of the stuff that I know when I was getting into the ecosystem from a lot of your videos too. So, um uh, if you want to learn about building anything in Solidity or, or DApp development, check out his his content, like videos. I don't know. Do you have a blog or, or is it mainly video stuff? Yeah, it's it's pretty much everything. So blogs, videos. Um, check out uh, if you guys. I think I can I can send them a uh, you guys a message, right? I can. Uh, yeah, you can pop a comment, and it should go to all yeah. three platforms. That's my Twitter. Um, it has a link to uh, alphachain.io slash blogs. Uh, I'm on Medium, YouTube, dev.to, uh, the Chainlink uh, blog, of course, kind of all over the place. So tons and tons of resources there. Okay, cool. Also so today, like, you know, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, also like, you know, just, just adding that, if you want to like explore the 
you know the 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 humor side of javascript check out patrick's videos he's he's hilarious talking about javascript and his oh. love for you know love. <laughs> hard yeah <work. laughs> love love me some javascript yeah that's uh luckily we we are going to go over some javascript today um and by luckily i mean unfortunately but you know so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone's joining now, we're about to do some demos. Uh, Patrick's going to be doing a demo showing uh, an application, uh, and it's all open source, I believe, how to kind of uh, build out a smart contract that generates dynamic um, NFTs using, using FG, SDG and Chainlink. Um, but before we actually uh, get to that part, um, I just want to mention if anyone is watching, you have any questions, if you have any comments, throw them in the chat. Uh, we'll get to those for sure. And uh, looking forward to hearing, you know, what other people have to say. So, like, right now, NFTs are kind of, like, really hyped right now. And I'm sure they'll go through, like, a hype cycle. Like, they're really, you know, hyped right now. And who knows what's going to happen six months from now or a month from now. But um, a lot of cool stuff happening. So, can, do you want to, like, just give your thoughts around what is the what NFTs are and, like, how they fit into the whole crypto ecosystem? Like, either one of you? Sure, <laughs> I know, like I everyone here is like <laughs> pretty interested in this space right now. Sure. I, to you, Pranav. All you, man. Uh, sure. I can, I can, you know, give you a brief as to what I am looking for in NFTs. I believe, you know, it all started with a hype where a red tile got sold for one million dollars, and you know, let's say a crypto punk with a mask on it got sold for eleven million dollars, and it, it was very much related to numbers. But if you go on the core fundamentals, you will understand that NFTs is nothing but storing something very unique on the internet. That's the most fundamental level of thinking about non-fungible tokens. Before this, before Web3, before blockchain, in general, it was not possible to have something very much antique, which is, which is having a store of itself on the internet you know, uh, using this concept. So this is something which is very new that the world has come up with. And I would say as we go digital, as we move from, you know, the physical world and accelerated by, you know, the, 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 the God's disease, COVID, we will not just have physical antiques, we'll also start getting into digital antiques and things that require uniqueness in their order, which is not controlled by anybody. So for me, non-fungible tokens in general is something which is internet's unique uh, creation. That's that's the first part. While we are talking about today, or the thing which is most hype today is digital art, and that's not the whole of NFTs. But I'll be you know much much more focused here because the currently the the whole ecosystem of non-fungibility and you know this this particular space is exploring this this particular paradigm. And what I believe in is that we have just got started even in this particular thing. I can see definitely there is a lot of, you know, mainstream celebrity adoption of non-fungible tokens and those kind of things. But I still believe, you know, things like hash mask with a lot of innovation in contracts and, you know, making art such a, a antique and unique contract-based, code-based thing, not getting so much success as uh, something which is, let's say, you know, or maybe CryptoPunk or something like Board ya API is something to do with, you know, we are still very much early and Web3 in general cannot be run without a very good community. You can be the best innovator in the world, but if you don't have a community, you know, evolving through it and understanding the value of that particular product, you will not be able to make it to the grounds of where the adoption has to be. This is the second part. And the third last part is, what I believe in the future of, you know, non-fungibility in general, I believe with Vitalik's vision of, you know, socialized, so, social space in, in, in Ethereum coming together and in blockchain, maybe social media and everything coming together, non-fungible token will have even more significance and we'll have to be, you know, very much uh, alive to see how it goes. So pretty excited. Yeah, likewise. Uh... It's just a kind of a crazy advent. One of the one of the biggest things for me is um, it was always very difficult for me to understand like how artists can get paid in the digital age when people can just copy paste whatever they make. Uh, and so to me, at, at least kind of from the from the smallest piece, you know, this is a way for artists to finally really get paid um, for the amazing content that they they create in, in the digital world, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And uh, NFTs actually do even more than just art, right? It's, it's just a smart contract standard. So it can be ticket stubs, it can be 
um, like randomized receipts. It can be kind of really whatever you want to do uh, that kind of fits into this this unique token standard. So uh, yeah, also just crazy excited for the world of nfts as it's exploding right now too so yeah totally and like um i'm kind of seeing like a correlation sometimes between the ethereum price going up and and like the nft market like chilling out a little bit and like today you're kind of seeing that a little bit like uh like eth is up and the nft market's like not as like i feel like as crazy like today as it normally is or something i don't i don't know if that's just me like um, portraying that, but um, someone like I, I watched uh, a talk or, or I saw someone mention that uh, NFTs kind of bring digital scarcity in a world that there was no scarcity in the past, and that kind of made a lot of sense to me. I think some of the areas that I'm extremely interested in, uh, along with some of the stuff that you're talking about, or maybe around um, like gaming and stuff. So like Axie Infinity is a really really good example of how you can kind of um, take the model of something like Fortnite where you're buying all these skins and all these uh, V bucks, but when you're done using them, like they don't go anywhere. You kind of like lose all that money or you lose that value. Um, and then uh, instead something like Axie Infinity where you're kind of like able to not only uh, keep the items that you're purchasing, but also like resell those things and they go up and down in value like a physical asset would. You're kind of bringing value to everyone participating in that ecosystem. And it just makes a lot more sense. And it seems like when you think about it, like would someone rather spend the next six months of their lives like spending time and money on something that's gonna go down the drain when they now have an option where they can actually hold on to some of that value. And logically it just makes so much more sense. And like that, that, that this is now enabled, it seems like a lot of games are gonna go that way. And I saw a tweet by the, the head of gaming at YouTube that kind of like was very, very bullish on, on NFTs. And he also was kind of echoing this sentiment. So I think you're gonna see a lot of games like taking advantage of this. And then to me also um, real estate, like I think in the future, being able to kind of fractionalize real estate with NFTs and, and ERC20 tokens will open the barrier, or will lower the barrier to entry to a lot of people that are able to kind of like buy into smaller shares uh, of real estate and a more on a more liquid market um and and participate in, in the economy in ways that they weren't in the past so um all that stuff is interesting also community stuff like um what you saw with board ape yacht club where they kind of raised almost 100 million dollars in like an hour or some crazy thing like that um now they have like this intellectual property that they can use to build out all kinds of stuff gaming um like you know um clothing, you know, um, maybe a, a video game or, or something like that, you know, maybe, maybe they'll do like a TV show. Like they have this IP and it's very valuable and it's re really well known and they have top celebrities kind of like using it. So like all this stuff is, is all happening at the same time. And again, this could be some like hype cycle that you, you, you know, kind of goes away six months, a year from now. But I think that the fundamental things that are happening are going to stick around and you'll see like ups and downs and, and things will get crazy and they won't get crazy. But overall, there's a lot of inter interesting things that are happening that are kind of going to build upon what you see happening today. At least that's kind of the way I look at it. With I think the board API thing that you're talking about and the crypto punks in general is more so a cult. It's more like, you know, if you have a board API like you do, Nader, I would love to, you know, ask your experience of having it and, the, uh, you know, the, the, the thinking behind making it happen. But without taking much time, I believe that, you know, board API uh, and crypto punks in general is more like making a cool club that you know we have this and this is like that's why we are the ogs of the web3 and the, the the you know decentralized community and we are a cult of people who do want to like if you even talk to the board api person's founder he has that views that you know when it is 2030 and everything is on blockchain and we need these specific people who are bored of you know those web2 guys we would create this club. We'll go into that particular art room and talk about you. So this is this is really interesting and you know definitely something related to cult community getting very strong, not just physically now, but very much digital. Interesting. That you say uh, you say cult in a in a positive light. That's that's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with it though. I'm with it. Yeah, there, there's definitely like a, a very, very strong following. I would say very, very strong. Or maybe, maybe cult. You know, we can go with cult. That works too. So, uh, do you want to give us an overview of the project that you're going to be um, kind of uh, yeah. doing today and walking through? Let's do it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share screen here. All right. Um, so I can do window right. So it's going to be the whole thing. Oh, whoops. 
Oh, we lost Pranav. Okay, cool. All right, so I, I do want to give a brief overview of NFTs. If you're brand new to NFTs, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to do this in, in maybe 20, 25 minutes, uh, please ask questions. Everybody who's watching, um, everybody here is smart contract experts, happy to answer any of these questions. But uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, when we're talking about NFTs, this NFT stands for non-fungible token, right? And that's just that's just kind of a fancy word, meaning it's unique, right? Each one of these NFTs is different, right? They're, they're unique tokens here. And all an NFT is, is a smart contract that has specific functions, right? So when we talk about ERC-721 or EIP-721, you'll hear these uh, a lot. I can zoom in a little bit here. Zoom in a lot here. Um, this is the EIP-721. This was the original proposal of what it looks like. And it kind of explains, here's what this idea for this NFT is. And boom, it gives this interface which says, okay, every NFT uh, needs to have a balance of function, an owner of function, uh, safe transfer from all these different functions, right? And let's say, hey, if you have these functions, congrats, you're an NFT. Now, the important ones that we're gonna be focusing on is this thing called a token URI. So when we're working with these NFTs, uh, and we're going to visualize them, we need a way to uh, to visualize them and see what they look like, right? So when we're talking like like board apes, right? For example, um, the board ape yacht club, they have a token URI that points to some uh, universal resource uh, identifier. That's what URI stands for, uh, which which I'll get to in a second, that says, hey, this is what this thing looks like. And this is the key function that in order for us to uh, show different images, we're going to have to manipulate this function here. So that's essentially what NFTs are. Uh, and this token URI is really just some type of URL, right? Um, some type of URL that uh, gets a response that looks like this, that has this JSON object response. And it's going to have a, a title or a name. It's going to have some attributes. Uh, and it's going to have this image URI thing, right? So this is this is essentially what it looks like. Um, I've got a, a more kind of up to date, in depth guide here. I just posted. Oh, let me, or let me send you the uh, the friend link. Um, I'm posting it in the chat here. If you guys want to read uh, uh, my little bit longer article on this, that's the sorry. The second one is the more up to date one. Um, but there's this thing called uh, this image URI. So here's an example. Of, of some metadata um, of that that will be, um, that's the token URI, right? This is gonna be what the response is. And in this, there's an image section, something like this, uh, another URI that says, hey, this is what this image looks like, right? And so this is what will show up uh, on OpenSea or on any of these NFT marketplaces when you look for it. Uh, now, we'll get into how this image URI is a little bit tricky uh, in just a second, but let's let's go ahead and talk about what we're particular going to be working with. So, the project that we're going to be working with is this repo here. Again, I will post this in the chat. Uh, it's called. Uh, it's at my GitHub Patrick Alpha C slash Chainlink the graph. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to create an NFT whose token URI changes or the image changes based off of some outside data or some outside parameter. So here is an example of what this NFT is going to look like on OpenSea, right? So this is OpenSea. This is on, on a Rinkby chain, which is a testnet for, of Ethereum. And basically, all this NFT is going to do is it's going to be a thumbs up if Ethereum is more than $2,000 or a thumbs down if it's less than $2,000. So we can see that it's thumbs up. So we know that it's it's more than $2,000. You got to pump those numbers up. I think it's like double that now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. What is what is ETH price? Oh, we, we could check the NFT directly to see the price. But yeah, uh, what is it? Three three thousand seven. All right. So so maybe I should have done uh, done like four thousand for the demo here and, and, and see. Or actually, we can even do that uh, when we deploy. We can. We oh, can cool. Deploy, okay. uh, we can deploy. Uh, we can change the parameter to four thousand, and we'll see that we'll see that thumbs down here. But so this is what we're going to be deploying, uh, and this is really interesting because in our code, uh, if we go to our contracts, uh, we have this feeds NFT dot Hopefully everyone can see this okay. We're gonna have, um, again, this token URI function because every NFT contract is gonna have this token URI function and it takes a token ID as the parameter. So every uh, every NFT of this type, of this NFT feeds type is gonna have a different token ID. And this is the function that's gonna return what the image looks like. Now we have some logic in here that basically said that pulls in the price using a chain link data feed, which um, if you want to learn more about how to get that in, 
definitely check out docs.chain.link. Go to get the latest price. Um, a really simple contract is here. You can hit deploy this contract using Remix. There's even kind of a, a basics tutorial with a video that will walk you through if you're brand new to smart contract development, walk you through everything here. But um, in any case, we pull the price in, we pull the price of Ethereum. And then what we do is we say, um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll set our image. Uh, let me zoom in just a little bit here. Okay, I, I wanna I wanna um, jump in real quick. Like, yeah, where we, where does the the data come from Chainlink? Like, how does that data come in? Is it like an API call? And yeah. like, you can't really talk to other APIs from smart contracts. Yeah. Typically. So how does that work? Um, amazing, fantastic, million dollar question here. So there's <laughs> uh, with without going too deep into kind of the longer answer. Um, you're absolutely right. Like blockchains are deterministic systems. So they themselves can't make API calls. They can't do like an HTTP get an HTTP post. Um, so what they actually do is they have, um, you can actually uh, emit an event. This is called like the basic request model that I'm going to briefly go over. You can check this out in the docs as well. Um, you, you can emit an event that these nodes are listening for. And in that event, we'll define what data that uh, the um, that the contract is looking for. Right, and so a, a node will get that and return some data uh, in a second transaction. Right, so this is this this quote unquote basic request model is a two transaction process. So one transaction, you emit that event saying, "Hey, Chainlink node, give me some data. I want some or some external computation or whatever." And in a second transaction, it will return the data um, back to the contract. Now um, it gets a little bit more complicated and and much much safer, more gas efficient, and more really cool uh, when we get to this thing called off-chain reporting, which is a much more advanced version of this. So uh, in this model, and this is kind of the current model of these data feeds that I'm going to talk about in just a second, is um, this uh, this request basically happens, but instead of it going to one node, uh, a, an entire decentralized network of nodes actually pull data and they talk to each other and they reach a consensus on what the data is off-chain. So for example, if we look at FUSD, um, this is kind of a, a, a visualization of one of these decentralized Oracle networks. We can see all the different Oracles to the right here, uh, hopefully I'm zoomed in enough, and each one of the answers that they're uh, responding with. So, so there's kind of the, each one of them has their little logos here. Uh, we can see kind of a little bit of a history of the data feeds, and we can see each one of these nodes and their responses. So O1 oh, node has, they all have slightly different responses because they're calling these APIs uh, at different times. Mm -hmm. Now, the really cool thing about off-chain reporting is if, if we look at this gas price section, we can see that most of these have blanks and there's only one that has a gas price. That's because uh, together they reach a consensus and they ch uh, 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 and choose a leader to actually send the transaction uh, mm -hmm. by a turn-based mechanism. Uh, now, they all cryptographically sign their answers as well. So whoever sends it can't actually manipulate anything. Uh, and then they're all also monitoring the network to see, ah, somebody hasn't responded in you know X number of minutes, I'm gonna jump in and respond. Um, so it's this turn-based uh, mechanism where they keep tabs on everybody. So it's this really, really uh, cool way to get data. But yeah, so they're, they're talking to each other off-chain, they're getting data, and then they post it on-chain uh, into this contract called the Aggregator V3 interface. And then once it's on-chain, once the data's there, um, we can just call uh, a view function to read that data. So this latest round data function is what's known as a view function, which means um, you know we could do it off chain when it costs us any gas uh, and just read that price from this contract after it's already decentralized and, and aggregated. So I'll pause for a second actually, because it looked like a couple comments came in uh, and Oh, oh, I was posting in the private chat. I wasn't posting in the comments. Oh, well. Oh, I, I posted a link to your GitHub, but if you had another, I think you oh. had another link that you wanted to share. Yeah, the other one was um, that, that better programming link. But um, yeah, so so I'll pause if there's any, uh, any, any of the questions. It looks like there's a couple comments in here. Where can you find the generator or is there a service for VRFs? We're going to get to that. Good question. Could you please share the link? Oh, gotcha. What's up? Okay. But yeah, so so uh, so Natter, did, did that make sense? Did I, did I, was I clear there? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I was going to say that, that helps a lot. So thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and just wanted to, you know, even uh, like Patrick did, did touch this particular point, but did want to, you know, specify that because of the mechanism of, you know, turn, turn base, there is no central or single point of getting data for the price feeds. Yes. And that's what makes it, you know, Web3 usable or Web3 stack. 
Exactly. Yeah, spot on. So uh, each one of those nodes is an independent operator. So right, there's independent, a decentralized network. They're all also getting data from different uh, different APIs, different exchanges, different groups, giving that data. So uh, decentralized at the node level and at the data level, which makes it, uh, yeah, exactly, you know, this incorruptible uh, system, which is fantastic. So uh, in any case, we pull this price in, and then all we do is we set our uh, the image of our NFT to something called low image URI, which is something that I'll get into in a second. Um, and if it's higher than our pricing point, then we'll say, okay, never mind, use that high image URI. So, right, so this is kind of a binary. We're doing thumbs up or thumbs down, but you could see how you could use this. You could have like a thousand frames, right? And then based off the price, you could say, okay, if it's between this range, use this image. Between this frame, use this image. Um, you could also generate some of these SVG images, uh, and I'll show you how to do that as well. Now, this is kind of the fancy part down here, because again, this token URI needs to return, uh, hold on, let me pull back up. Let me pull back up that um, metadata piece. Oh, I'm just gonna go back here. Needs to pull up, it needs to pull up something that looks like this, right? So since we're actually gonna store all of our data, all, all of our metadata right on chain, we can actually do that by directly uh, defining this metadata file you know, as a string. So there's a couple of kind of fancy things going on here with like ABI and code packed and string. Um, but basically what we're doing is we're putting this, uh, we're putting uh, the, the, the framework of this metadata uh, and then we have a variable, which is gonna be the name, uh, which is just gonna be what, whatever the name of it is, which is like feeds NFT or something like that. And this image URI, uh, which is gonna be that variable one, right? So back in in our, our, our full example here, we're just gonna change this image flag so that the image URL, excuse me, the image URI is gonna be different. So that's really mm -hmm. the main piece here. Um, to put these I, images, okay. Yeah. Uh, one, one. We just wanted to jump in yeah. because, like, you know, you are using IPFS. So, you know, in case you want to explain about this the one, imaging, this one actually isn't IPFS. This is a hundred percent on chain. Which is can you show us that that the URLs again, real quick? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I keep, I keep like deleting them. So this is, uh, this is kind of like the simple example here. So where to go? Here it is. So this is. Let me zoom in just a hair. This one is IPFS, yeah. yeah so, so, so this one in um in this kind of example here, the image is hosted on IPFS, right? And that's what a lot of these projects do is they'll host it on IPFS. Which yeah, is this great. is a pretty good conversation to have because yeah. it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so, so uh, let me yeah, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit. So uh, IPFS, I know we're we're kind of throwing a lot of terms in here. Uh, IPFS is kind of this decentralized file storing. Um, uh, it's not a blockchain, but it's kind of based off this peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, infrastructure. And we can store files to it, and anybody can uh, do what's called pin those files and host like that data on their own node. Now, um, I do kind of want to get through the rest of the demo, and then we can talk about some of the pros and cons of some of these different strategies, because this is decentralized. However, there is a chance that I'm the only one hosting this image, which makes it centralized, right? So anybody can host the image just by pinning it, but that doesn't need, necessarily mean everybody will. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So what we're doing in, in this uh, demo here is our, instead of hosting our image on IPFS, which again, you know, if we copy paste this one, you know, this is the image that's hosted on IPFS, which is really cool. Instead of hosting it on IPFS, we're actually hosting it on the blockchain itself. Right, so we're going to host this this image URI, this this um, URL that kind of defines what this image looks like on IPFS, or excuse me, on Ethereum. And the way we can do that is a little bit fancy. And yeah, we, this is cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is yeah. This is a. Uh, I'm hoping I'm not taking too long. I, I want to like. Uh, no, no, you're not. Yeah. All right, cool. So, uh, so this is uh, we're using what's called SVG, which scans for uh, scalar. Scalable vector graphics, right? And so it's really, it kind of looks like HTML, but it's a way to define like exactly what lines are gonna do. Um, and what we do then is we take that SVG and we kind we basically encode it in something called base 64 encoding. And um, we can actually use a URI 
um, that has this encoded SVG as the URI of our uh, of our token. So hopefully that was clear, but let me, I'll, I'll explain. And, and you basically have two SVGs defined in the smart contract and you're returning that, that code based on what's returned from Chainlink. Exactly. Can you show what those what that code looks like because it's probably just really ugly, like crazy SVG like code, right? Or, or, or... yeah. So so um so it's actually it's not so bad. Let me uh, let me show. Yeah, let me. Uh... Because I've written SVG and HTML, and I'm just assuming it looks something like that. It's pretty much the same. So in here we have this image file. Uh, we have this SVG folder, and these are the thumbs up and thumbs down. Okay, so these are just SVGs, like the the same SVGs you would use, exactly, like in a web application. Yep. Yeah. Let me let me show. Oh, it's not gonna. Can I see the? Will it even show you what it looks like? Yeah. Right. Can I can I see the code, please? Uh, well, I'm gonna flip to my. Uh, I'm gonna flip to my uh, code editor, anyways. Actually, so so this is perfect timing. Let me just flip over there. So like, you know, just to explain a bit more there, the thing is, as Patrick is showing, he's converting the SVG into byte 64. IPFS also converts it into a hash and stores, blockchain, uh, stores that on-chain. Similarly, is converting into byte 64 and, you know, storing that because storing the whole image on blockchain will be <laughs> very, very costly given the yeah. price today, 100 way or something. Yeah, and uh, and I'll get into uh, I'll get into the uh, kind of a lot of the trade offs in a little bit too. But yeah, so here's what this SVG looks like, uh, kind of in code, right? This is the thumbs down in code. This is you know exactly what is using to draw this thumbs down thing. So um, there's some really good tutorials uh, on how to actually do this stuff. But basically, um, kind of this this main piece is we have kind of defining the version, some starting points, the height and width, blah blah blah, some other stuff. Um, but then we get into this path thing, and this is what really kind of defines where the lines and what's being drawn. So M, I think, is like move to and say, hey, move here, then move here, and then C is like circular something. But it's basically defining a whole bunch yeah, of... Yeah, and you probably wouldn't like write this SVG yourself. Like most of the time you use a tool to create <laughs> exactly. it. Like you can use Photoshop or like, you know, yeah. one of those types of tools. But I think there's also some web tools and all kinds of stuff. Even like um, a lot of the projects like the noun project that allow you to download um, images, like will also give you the option for an SVG. So you like never have, you don't have to write all these. Of yeah. course, if you're like an expert, you might, you know, understand it, but I don't, I usually just like use an SVG <laughs> and export it from a tool. Yeah. So, um, but it is cool to just see it though, because like, you know, without seeing it, it's just, a, you're just basically returning a string, right? Like, and you're using that string to kind of like, you know, create this and you're, you're calling that base 64 or you're calling some function maybe in the smart contract i forgot but uh, basically you're you're using um a path that's written in svg and 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 stuff like that so yes yeah, so, so spot on like I, I didn't i didn't draw this thumbs down myself i copy pasted it and uh <laughs> and that was that was how i got it right there i, I went to an svg generator I looked for a thumbs down, you know, somebody, somebody more clever than me with this stuff, you know, had made one of these and, uh, and yeah, exactly. Or you can export it from Photoshop. Um, in another example, I have some more complicated, uh, SVGs. Um, but as you'll see, the bigger your SVG, the more expensive this is to store. Hence, you know, why a lot of people will store an IPFS, but, uh, in any case, so that's kind of the thumbs down piece. And let's go back to the contract real quick and I'll, I'll show you exactly what's happening. So we have this function in here called um, add low SVG and add high SVG. And basically what this is saying, uh, what these functions do is they say, okay, here's what our, our raw SVG code is for you know, below 2000 and above 2000. So low is for below 2000, high is for above 2000. We literally just take that SVG code that we just saw, input it as a string parameter to this, and what we do is I have this function in here called save to image UR or SVG to image URI. And this is what's going to convert it on chain um, to a URI, to a token, um, to an image URI of that SVG, uh, which sounds kind of wild and it is kind of wild. <laughs> um, so we have this, uh, you can do this off chain as well, but I did want to show you it on chain because this shows, okay, if you can convert this stuff on chain, then hypothetically, what you could do is you could parameterize all of this. You could parameterize the width, the height, uh, the view box, like where these lines go. 
And you, you could like that. programmatically create an SVG if you were like really, really smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have a I have a, another demo um, where uh, it uses random commands to to print a random SVG, like all on chain. So it's a hundred percent on chain. You know, it's it's absolutely wild. So uh, what um, we do? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please. Well, there was like this project that I tweeted about a handful of times called Generative Masks, and it basically used a token ID to generate some um, dynamic JavaScript, like a canvas type of stuff, which is really cool. But um, but it was basically hosted on IPFS. So like if, you know, for whatever reason, that token IPFS address like was removed or something like that, the SVG would be gone theoretically, right? Um, or the, the image would be gone. But if you do this on chain, it can never go away ever, right? So that's kind of like, to me, the biggest thing to consider. And yeah, right. um, a couple of people were talking so, about what's that? So just to our dear now. Well, I think your audio is oh, oh, messing up. Is, yes. it, is, it, is, it, yeah, hold is on. your is the audio coming through? Yeah, weird weird for you, uh, Jace. Can we can we mute Pranav real quick? Yeah, I think your audio might be messed up a little bit. Um, but a couple of people are like asking a couple of questions about gas costs and stuff like that. Um, so is the transaction cost going to be higher or is there going to be a lot more gas when you do it this way because you're doing more like computation? Yeah, yeah, it is going to be higher. And that's going to be one of the things, uh, I, uh, that I, I will get to, you know, once, once I finish going through it, but I did want to point out, um, this protocol cause, uh, this Oni chain, uh, NFT project, cause, um, they were actually the ones who kind of first showed me kind of a lot of the really cool stuff that you can do. Um, you can definitely go go check out their contracts as well. Uh, really cool project. They they use Chainlink VRF to uh, mint verifiably random NFTs using kind of this this crazy on chain SVG method. They're not hosting any any of these these images here. They're all SVGs. They're not hosting hosting it on IPFS. They're all randomly generated, and it's it's kind of mind blowing to me. Um, so I, oh, my also my camera is a little too hot. It's a little too spicy in here. So uh, it's probably going to shut off in in a second. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> um, no worries. Uh, or it's or it's gonna stay on. I don't know. Whatever. Oh no, this is my. Uh, oh, it's my. Oh, I was wondering why my quality was so bad. It's because it's it's my IMAX uh, camera. So no wonder. So never mind. It's not gonna overheat because my other camera <laughs> overheated. Um, but in any case, uh, so here is uh, here is the code uh, that SVG code, anyways. And what we do is we take this data image, uh, this is kind of the beginning of the URL, right? You normally how you see like a URL, you'll see HTTPS, you know, dot, dot, slash, slash, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is the beginning of that URL. And uh, added on to this is we, we add the base 64 encoded version of that SVG code. And that's exactly what the rest of this does. Uh, we've imported this base 64 package um, and we encode this SVG stuff, and that's all we do. And then this uh, this ABI dot encode pack base URL SVG base sixty four encoded is basically how you concatenate strings uh, in Solidity, and boom, and that's going to be our URI for any SVG. So, without all that being said, let's go through uh, a demo. Oh, and let me just undo anything. Um, let me just go through a demo. Um, this uh, all this code that we're going to go through is written uh, in Hardhat. Um, so if you want to go check out uh, the repo, uh, if you know Hardhat, great. If you know Brownie, I have a, an NFT mix uh, with, with Brownie. That's really, really cool. But uh, we have our deploy um, our deploy folder. We're using kind of this Hardhat plugin called Deploy. It'll deploy um, a fake price feed contract for us, and then it'll deploy our NFT. If, if you guys want me to go through this, um, I can go through it in a little bit, but let's just let's just go ahead and run the code. Um, I have a, a hard hat shorthand installed, and I can just do hard hat commands with HH. So I'll do hard hat deploy. We'll hit enter, and it's going to deploy to kind of a fake uh, a fake blockchain here, a fake hard hat blockchain, and it deployed really really quickly. It said adding low URI, adding high URI. This is where we called those. Um, I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of code here. Um, Hard hat is so nice, right? We uh, even though I hate I hate JavaScript, but hard hat is 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 pretty. I, I like hard hat. Um, I'm trying to build some stuff for Solana um, like a week or two ago, and I was 
I instantly reminded like how good Hard Hat was. Yeah, because they don't have something like that in that ecosystem. There, there's a team actually for Solana. For those of you who want to know, um, uh, they have this thing called Anchor that they're working on. That's supposed to be kind of like the hard hat of of Solana. It's still kind of in beta, but I, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to Anchor kind of ramping up. Nice. But so we added this low URI, which was that SVG. We added the high URI, which was the thumbs up. Uh, we called our create function, which creates the NFT. Uh, and this also does, um, uh, uh, it also assigns uh, our, 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 our token URI to that NFT. And then uh, I went ahead and printed out the token URI of this NFT. So this, this huge URL or this URI is that SVG encoded URI of, um, of this NFT. Now, if we paste this into our, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm making you have to flip back and forth here, Natter. Uh, no, no, go for it. If we paste this into our, our browser here. Oh, share screen, window, this one. It looks like a massive mess. Uh, this is because on this browser, I don't have, uh, excuse me, on this user, I don't have like the nice JSON of five plugin. Um, but it shows it shows exactly that same metadata we were talking about, right? We have name, Chainlink feeds NFT. We have a description. We don't have any attributes, but we have this image section, which defines another giant long URI here, which if we copy paste, we can see that this is a, a thumbs up. We're saying, hey, um, the price is higher, uh, which I, I didn't change the code to make it be a thumbs down. Um, but essentially, this is what this image would look like on OpenSea, and we can even... Um, I'm going to flip back and forth again. Keep going. Go for it. All right, cool. Uh, if we want to deploy this live, uh, let's go ahead and, and change this so that it's um, the threshold is different. So where do we define the threshold in here? Where do we define the 2000? So constructor is the price feed address, low URI, high URI. Maybe when you deploy, do you pass it into the constructor? Token ID to if price is higher than token ID to high value. So let's find where we define this. Create right here. When we call this create function, that's when we define the high value. So let's go ahead in our deploy feeds. Let's look for when we call the create function. All right, cool. We call it high value. I know I'm bouncing around a lot. I'm sorry. So this is our two thousand dollars here. Oh, uh, okay. So you have to figure out how to convert that. All we got to do is add the five here. Right? Okay. And so hypothetically, if we deploy this now, this should be a thumbs down. So we're gonna do hard hat deploy, and I'm getting nervous because we're doing one of these live deployments, right? Network ring B, uh, we're gonna reset the deployment. And what this should do is it should do everything that we just did with the difference being that the threshold is now $5,000. So this should be a thumbs down because we just checked. What does reset there. do? Yeah, so reset means that um, it's, it's saying if, if we run a deploy script and we already have a contract deployed, um, Hard Hat will be like, oh, you already have a contract deployed. I'm going to uh, skip the deploying part and I'll just do all the other stuff. Since um, we actually changed um, a, kind of a fundamental feature of the contract, I'm saying, hey, just, just redeploy everything, even if everything's the same. Um, Hard Hat will redeploy. Um, if you if we change stuff in the smart contract, but we didn't, we only changed you know one of these parameters, and Hardhat's not smart enough to know that the parameter is different. So, so that's what this reset does. So if we grab this now, and once again we're gonna we're gonna flip over to uh, Ether Scan. We're gonna flip. I'm gonna share screen in just a second. And while this is deploying, I'll, I'll answer some more questions here. Uh, window. So this is the transaction. It's gonna take take a hot minute to to go through. Yeah, one of the questions that that yeah. we didn't we we kind of addressed it just very very uh, superficially, but maybe we can dive a little bit deeper on there. Like, what are the use cases for dynamic NFTs? Yeah, yeah, great question. So this uh, dynamic NFTs will add uh, a huge kind of uh, utility to these NFTs, right? A lot of people, what they'll do is they'll kind of they'll create their art, which is great, uh, and then they'll put it on um, put it into an NFT and say, hey. I did it. I made NFT. I did art, uh, which is cool and which is great. Um, but like I said, these NFTs can do more than just be art. Um, they can have these functionalities. And this is an example of, of uh, creating this art that changes over time and that changes depending on some real life uh, value. So this is um, so it just adds this this extra layer 
um, to just really empowering your smart contracts to do to do absolutely crazy things. So I need to be on the ring the ether scan. Are no you your your alien mode, buddy? It's, uh, uh, it's, it sounds uh, like you're, 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 you're underwater, trying to slowly kill us. Um, yeah, for some reason your audio is really sounding strange. Maybe unplug your mic and then plug it back in and try that. We'll see. We'll see if that works. About now. Hey. Oh, much better. There we go. Yes, that was that was the ticket. Yeah. yeah, go ahead and repeat what you said because we didn't get any of it. Yeah, right. Just just adding to the dynamic NFT part, I believe NFTs with gaming will have a really good you know combination of dynamic NFTs. One example would be Ave Gochi, where the Gochis are dynamically inside the NFT, you know, changed in such a way that it can be unique based on a number, and it cannot be unique based on a number. So, like you know, as you're talking about applications, this is the first application here here for you that gaming plus NFTs will always require dynamization of NFTs because it's just not about the art, but also about the rarity of that art and you know how as a monster are you going to use it. So pretty, pretty strong there. Yeah, yeah, spot on. So uh, so here's the contract that we just deployed. Uh, it's it's verified because I've, I've deployed contracts like this recently. So either scan smart enough to know it's, it's the same thing, but we can see all the different functions we called, right? So we have our contract creation here. We added our, our low SVG code and the high SVG code. And then we called our create uh, to create one token of this kind, right? So now what we can do is if, if everything is good, we can go to testnets.opensea.io uh, uh, we should be able to grab this contract address, paste it into OpenSea. We see there's this chain link feeds object that comes up. Uh, and here is token ID zero. And yeah, because we're waiting for that 5,000, which is probably going to come yeah. in the next couple of days. So <laughs> so, so uh, if you guys, uh, if everybody here grabs this, uh, I don't know how to send it to you all. But uh, if, you, if you find this on OpenSea, uh, it, whenever we have 5,000, this will flip to a thumbs up, uh, which would be wild. But yeah, that's so that's how you deploy this. Um, something really important to note too, is while we were deploying this, we emitted events. Um, and emitting those events means that a, a protocol like the graph can then go ahead and index every time somebody mints one of these NFTs. Anytime somebody, uh, we, we could have added more events to kind of change values and, and do all this other crazy stuff, but uh, we can gather all that data really, really easily uh, using the graph protocol. So. Um, right. this, is, this is a really, really, really cool way of, of generating these NFTs. And yes, everyone's kind of been saying, hey, what are the trade-offs here? Um, this is kind of like the hardo way, uh, putting your image URI uh, on Ethereum. Probably not the best use for Ethereum because as everyone kind of noticed, this is incredibly expensive. Um, in one of my other demos, I deployed an SVG NFT that cost something like 2 million gas. Um, so you do the math, 2 million gas times, you know, $30 GUI price. We're talking like, I don't know, I think it was like 0.1 ETH or something like that to deploy an NFT, <laughs> which is really expensive. Um, maybe, maybe what is it like $400 or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Not, not, not great. Um, so what a lot of people do is they do this IPFS method, which is where they store this image onto, like I said, this, this, this decentralized peer to peer uh, data network. That's better because it's going to be a lot cheaper to store images. Um, the issue with that is uh, if somebody, if everyone stops pinning your, your data, uh, the image can go away, that URI can go away. Um, so there, uh, there's, there's one additional step, which is doing something like Filecoin, uh, which doing that is, is definitely a little bit trickier, where basically you pay these Filecoin nodes to pin IPFS for you. Um, and you can kind of keep track of how much money is being spent there. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I I talked too long for a long time. Uh, I will I will shut up now. Now that's a pretty interesting. Uh, the, the to me the most one of the most interesting problems about NFTs or you know I don't know if you would consider it a problem, but the the thing that hasn't been like a hundred percent I would say figured out industry wide that everyone is kind of like um, you know all focusing on doing the same way. Uh, there are two 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 things really. The image metadata. So like there is no standard for the actual metadata. So you you typically just have a content URI, and that could look like anything. I think it'd be really interesting to kind of have like that more standardized. And we've even had a working group 
at the at the graph with the other uh, protocols to kind of try to figure that out. Um, and then the other thing though is the content, like where does that content live? And, you, and you, we talked about a few different ways to do it. You know, IPFS. You know, you're doing it on chain. In this example, um, I've even seen projects launch with centralized content URIs like GCP or AWS, which is kind of like for sure not the right way to do it. Um, but like, and then there's Arweave. I don't know if you know a lot about Arweave, but like we're kind of exploring that. Um, I, I, I'm really interested to kind of see where this goes because I feel like if uh, one of the narratives that you hear in, in the Web2 world, the people that don't like NFTs are like, oh, this is just like something that can go away completely. And they kind of like, they have a point to some extent, but they, but they don't, it's more nuanced than that. But I think having like a real good answer to that would be helpful for people that are kind of like interested in this stuff. Also, one more thing to add here is kind of controversial, but I do want to bring this up is like ERC 721 is a standard for creating these kind of like, you know, super rare stuff. And it is, it, it, it is a little, uh, you know, older code, same as ERC 20. So the question would be, will we have another standard because ERC 721 in itself is a very, you know, gas intensive standard. And, you know, it's, it's not very uh, cool to have these kind of things while we are creating the next economy where social you know cre uh, creations will also have their own nfts on chain possibly not with something which might be centralized via ipfs or maybe rv which is still growing so like you know kind of kind of one more thing i'm really excited to explore is that in future we might also have an e uh, standard similar to erc721 creating variables for us yeah i i, I think it's the the ERC six seventy seven and seven seventy seven is like a perfect example of that, right? Like we're we're kind of got caught up in ERC twenty now. Everyone does the whole proof stuff, even though it, there, there's kind of a lot of evidence that uh, that kind of sucks it's <laughs> to spend all the gas doing all these approves and stuff. Um, we have a couple of questions, and I want to kind of see if we can get to some of these. Uh, hey, Florin. Hey, Renee. I see a bunch of people in here. I know, um, but I thought this was a pretty good question um, because it was something I also had when I first started getting into this stuff. So like, what is the difference between hard hat, truffle and brownie and kind of like you as someone that's been doing this for quite a while, like how do you view the ecosystem as far as like Ethereum development environments are concerned? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So they're, they're all just different smart contract development frameworks, right? So uh, hard hat, the one I just demoed here is a JavaScript based one. So uh, for deploying your smart contracts, for testing your smart contracts, for kind of doing anything outside of solidity that uh, a traditional like software engineering firm or group would do that's where these smart contract development frameworks are going to help out uh, hard hat and truffle are both javascript based or or typescript based so if you're used to that you know you can kind of jump right in and and already you know know how to deploy know how to test and then brownie is python based so yeah pranav pointed out at the beginning i make a lot of javascript jokes i'm not, I'm, I'm not a big javascript fan uh, for for I think that for deploying a lot of these backends, Python is just way more intuitive and way makes makes a lot more sense. But uh, I understand it. You know, if you're, especially if you're doing full stack development, you know, maybe you want to just do kind of that Node.js everywhere um, mentality. Uh, then great. But and I know a lot of people uh, really like Hard Hat, so that's why I did the the demo here in Hard Hat. But uh, yeah, for most of my projects, I use Brownie just because I like Brownie. I, I like Python. So yeah, it, it's really up to you. It's whatever you want to use. Um, the tool most people um, start with, and I think everyone should start with, uh, is Remix. Remix is just Solidity. Um, it, I think it recently added hard hat plugins, though. Um, but it's great for just getting started, get, getting going, and really visualizing what's going on with these smart contracts. Um, another that, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's that's you know pretty strong, and I believe that Remix can be a starting point, but. Hard hat does have its own like you know chain being created and being run on its own structure. While we also should acknowledge like Truffle was the first you know one to bring this tooling to 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 reality while making these things up. Uh, I, I just want to quickly touch on a point which you know uh, Patrick did uh, touch up, which is like all these events. Why are we using these kind of events? And what? How do we get this uh, railed up? Uh, so, 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 you know, just wanted to in a minute talk about that, that, you know, the graph has been indexing these kind of things. What that means is that these NFTs do exist on the blockchain in a language structure and you want to portray them to the front end. And of course, in a decentralized uh, manner, like Chainlink puts the data inside the blockchain, the graph 
in a way gets that particular contract based nft based data outside we are going to explore that soon in in coming videos but yeah this this, this was how you get the data or how you see things on the front end um someone asked if this is being recorded yeah it'll be on my youtube and it'll also be available um on twitter for you know on my, on my feed so you can you can check that out um florin is in here and someone is saying hello to florin um so hey florin <laughs> um someone's shilling their nft and i'm not gonna like uh share that comment so <laughs> um let's see here so can you explain is it possible for a rare NFT which opens on IPFS can disappear if those IPFS data is not maintained? Um, yeah, this is a good question. I think we kind of like covered this. Like, yes, this is this is possible, but there's also a function that is made available to the owner, I believe, um, and also to the contract owner, at least to the best of my understanding, with a lot of these projects that allow you to maybe update the content URI. Is that is that true? Um, it, it depends on how you code it. So yeah. you can code it and say like, hey, only the owner can change this, this parameter. Um, but it's it's really up to kind of the smart contract developer. And and that's something that is is hopefully going to get better as time goes on is we'll be able to see, you know, who has authority to change what in smart contracts. And that is something that um, is definitely a, an area of discussion for a lot of the big projects that, you know, maybe still have like an admin key that can, you know, change some of these big protocols. But um, I unfortunately have to jump off. I got I got another meeting, but oh right, yeah, yeah. we're we're we are uh, and over uh, over on time. So um, yeah, so that that's cool. We can wrap it up. So um, thanks everyone for for stopping by. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Pranav, for 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 joining me today. This was a really great discussion. I think um, if you have any questions, uh, reach out to me or any of these folks on Twitter. What are your Twitter handles? And then we'll we'll, we'll go ahead and jump off. And mine's uh, mine's Patrick Alpha C. Feel free to hit me up. I, I look like a big frog, big blue frog. And that's <laughs> Both of these people are NFTs. I am the only legit face. So mine is <laughs> I am Pranav M underscore. You can also hit me up. My DMs are open for help. All right, cool. Well, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, that, that's it for today. Um, I'll be back actually in two days with uh, Cooper Turley to talk about um, a lot of cool DAO stuff and um, and community stuff, which is like one of my favorite topics. So we'll see you, uh, we'll see you in a couple of days and um, yeah, we'll see you on Twitter as well. Later, everyone. Thanks, all.